Loving Father in heaven, there's a lot of noise in this world, a lot of voices, a lot of distractions. Everywhere we turn, there's a new problem, a new situation, relationships in crisis, health issues, money, you name it, Lord. We're being inundated. We're being pummeled. But now we are sitting in this beautiful auditorium. We're going to open your word. Lord, we need you to speak. We need you to teach. We need your Holy Spirit to flood our minds and hearts. And so we avail ourselves of that. We humble ourselves before you and we say, please, Lord, teach us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please open your Bibles today to John chapter 6. We'll continue our study in the life of Jesus. Our passage today is verses 30 through 35. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and that's what will appear on the screen. John 6, verse 30. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then, that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never hunger thirst. Let's get some context. <clears throat> Jesus had worked what some scholars, excuse me, I don't know what it is about you people. <laughs> I had a sermon at nine o'clock taught a Sabbath school class, <clears throat> but in front of you, I can't keep my throat clear. So, all right, I'm going to start over. <clears throat> Some context. Jesus has fed 5,000 numbered men, women and children who were not numbered, so likely 15 to 20,000 people. Some scholars consider it his greatest miracle. You know, maybe the person wasn't really blind that started to see. Maybe the person wasn't really deaf that started to hear. And maybe just with psychological manipulation, Jesus was able to do a lot of things. But you cannot take five small barley loaves and feed 15,000 people with it. You can't fake that. You can't convince people they've eaten when they haven't. So Jesus fed them, and the people were so excited they tried by force to make him their king. Jesus sent the apostles away. They'd gotten caught up in it. He dismissed them, or told them to get into the boat, and then he dismissed the crowd. Jesus was alone on the mountain praying that night, and sometime between 3 and 6 a.m., he walked on the water out to the boat. It's there where Peter walked on the water, and we have that story. They came to shore. And the people that had experienced that miracle were looking for Jesus. In John chapter 6, they find him. Our story today begins with verse 30. But we're going to back up into last week's story a little bit, so we still understand the context. In verse 26... Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. 
do not labor for the food which perishes, but for food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Jesus is saying, you ate the loaves, and that's why you're here. You want more. He said, don't labor for the food that perishes, but for food that endures to everlasting life. Jesus will be in a continual struggle trying to help people understand the eternal versus the essential. He is forever trying to expand their thoughts away from the temporal to what will never, ever end. Jesus comments, or the Bible comments in verse 28, Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus' response is verse 29, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. This is our context. Now Jesus is going to continue the conversation with these people and they with him. So in verse 30, they say, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Do something that we can see. Do something we can believe and we will follow you. They have something in mind, something very particular, and it becomes a little clearer for us in verse 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. You see, the rabbis had taught that Moses was the first redeemer. Moses had led the people of Israel out of Egypt into the borders of the promised land, and he was considered the first redeemer. They also included in that that it was Moses' influence with God that caused manna to descend from heaven. And that happened every day for 40 years while the people journeyed in the wilderness. So Moses was their first redeemer. They taught that their second redeemer would be the Messiah. And the Messiah would cause manna to descend from heaven every day forever. So these people are asking for that. They're saying, okay, well, if you're that guy, let's see it. We see it, we'll believe it, and we will follow you. If you go to Exodus chapter 16, it's the second book in the Bible. We're just going to look at a couple verses here. But it will help us to understand the whole issue and uh, what's going on here regarding manna. Chapter 16, verse 1. And they journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. We are two and one-half months out of Egyptian captivity. They're on their own now, two and a half months out. Verse 2, then the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. I mean, it just sounds so pitiful. Sure, they didn't have food, but they wished they had died back in Egypt near the flesh pots. Verse 4, then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. They murmured. It will be a continual problem with them. Back up to verse 24 of the previous chapter. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What? shall we drink. In just a few 
verses in chapter 16 five times. They're murmuring. So they're very interested and concerned about what they're going to drink and what they're going to eat. Thirsting and hungering and then continually complaining about it. Their whole focus was on the here and the now. And Jesus' focus was on the eternal. Let's go back to John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, we'll move forward just a little bit to verse 41. It says, then the Jews, excuse me, the Jews then murmured against him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. So you have people 1,400 years before Jesus receiving manna and murmuring. 1,400 years later, their children are still murmuring. Not much has changed for those people. And they've come to Jesus saying, show us what you got and we will follow you. Let's go back to chapter 6, verse 32. Jesus will speak to this. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Jesus is saying, that bread didn't come to you from Moses. It was a gift from God. And there is a true bread that is not manna. Manna was a fading type or a shadow of the true that would come. Manna came and went, then was gone. Hunger was alleviated for a short while, then it returned and the cycle began over. Manna did not provide one thing for the soul. It was all physical. Manna did not give eternal life. Manna was all physical. John 6, verse 33. For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is saying the bread of God, the true bread, is a person. It is not a product. It is not something you gather and bake and share with others. The true bread is a person. You see, manna was an isolated experience for the Jews. The true bread is for the whole world. Manna did not prevent death. The true bread will. This true bread will even tell us in this discourse, we're not studying it today, that even though you die, you will not be dead. You'll have eternal life. You'll be raised at the last day. Now, manna was miraculous, and it was miraculous in its origin, but it's material in nature. Jesus is speaking of bread that is spiritual in nature. We get confused sometimes. They were confused. They use their confusion as an excuse not to serve Jesus. If you look at John 6, verse 63, it says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that Jesus gave, they are spirit and life. We as human beings are overwhelmed with concern about our flesh. We worry about what we will eat. We worry about what we will wear. We worry about what our house will look like. We are consumed with the temporal. We are consumed with the physical. Jesus is very, very concerned about the eternal, and that's what this study is about. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, in Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount. 
Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Unfortunately, some people stop there. It is not the entirety of the verse. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You can be starving and filled with righteousness. You can be suffering from want and still have your body saturated with the Holy Spirit of God. That's what it means to be filled. Because God is trying to bump our thinking away from the physical to the spiritual realm. Matthew 6, verse 34. Let's go back to our passage. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Now they're not getting it. They still see bread as a wonderful thing, but it's a material food. And they will follow Jesus if he is able to feed them every day. You may or may not be aware of this, of what the Jews believed. We are told in the book of Hebrews that in the Ark of the Covenant, there was a bowl of manna that was placed there. So the Jews believed that. And they believed that this pot of manna was in the Ark of the Covenant, that it was placed inside Solomon's temple sometimes, sometime around 1040 B.C., and that it remained there for 400 years until the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. And they believed that Jeremiah the prophet took the Ark of the Covenant, hid the Ark of the Covenant, and they were taught this by their rabbis that that would be discovered and produced again when the Messiah came. And that the establishment of the kingdom of the Jews would begin with that. They would take that very bowl of manna and begin to feed the Jewish nation. And the Messiah would do that. Jesus, they're being, Jesus is being told, you produce that manna to substantiate your claim, and we will follow you. Verse 35, this was shocking to them, what Jesus is going to say. Jesus said to them, I am the bread. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus says, I am that bread. I'm the bread I'm talking about. Jesus clearly declared himself to be the bread. In John 6, verse 48, he repeats it. I am the bread of life. John 6, verse 51, he repeats it. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. In John 6, verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. But it goes on. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Come to Jesus you never hunger. Believe in Jesus, you never thirst. Do you know what Jesus is saying here? He is saying to them, I am what you are asking for. I am He. It is a person. And the hunger and the thirst of your souls can only be satisfied by me. So, you come to Jesus, you'll never hunger. That, mean, that, that means you, you believe in Jesus. You come to Jesus, you never hunger. You believe in Jesus, you never thirst. I want you to think about this for a minute. When you're on a physical journey, you need bread, you need water. Bread is not just bread, but it's symbolic of food. Water is symbolic of water. 
On a physical journey, you need bread and water. On a spiritual journey, you need bread and water for the soul. Jesus is dealing with the soul here. And what food and drink are to the physical body, Jesus himself is to the soul. Hunger of the soul. What, what does that mean? What is the hunger of our soul that can be satisfied? Well, I can think of three things right off, and you can probably think of dozens more. But to hunger, the hunger of the soul, first thing that comes to my mind is being accepted. And think about that. How old were you when you realized how important it was for you to be accepted by other people? When I was four, they started me in kindergarten. I was tall for my age. I guess they thought I was smart, too. I fooled them. But when I got to kindergarten and started relating to people outside of our little neighborhood and family, and there were, there were kids there, and we had show and tell. I wanted to be accepted. Family of five, dad a state policeman, mom a working mother at home, didn't have a lot of income. I didn't have a lot to show. But I come from a family of tellers. So I would make up stories. Some of you have heard some of the stories I've made up. I wanted to be accepted. I learned that at age four. I wanted to be accepted. And I want you to think about this for a minute. How many bad decisions have you made just because you wanted to be accepted? How awful have you felt in your life because you didn't feel accepted. Jesus is saying, you come to me and I'll accept you. And, and, and I don't care how you color this thing if God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, God Almighty, who, who is the King, if He accepts us, it's all downhill from there. Do you get that? How is the hunger of the soul? What about being forgiven? I've been reading that nostalgia is a new escape for people. I guess it's always been, but it's almost at a uh, mental illness level where people are escaping back into those times where they thought it was so much better. I got thinking about it. Yeah, I do that. Uh, I, I go back in my mind all the time. But rather than thinking how wonderful it is, for some odd reason, all my sins come flooding towards me. And I think, yikes! I'm glad I've been forgiven. Do you know how wonderful it is to have guilt and shame taken away? Gone. It's not there. If it comes around, it's just a temptation from the devil to wallow in it. But God says there's none. It's gone. Accepted. Forgiven. What else could be a hunger of the soul? How about value. We all want value. We all want a place. We all want purpose. We have God saying, I'll show you your value. Look what my son paid. That's your value. You're mine. You're in the family. You have a place. You have a purpose. But what then could be the thirsting of the soul? Well, when you think of thirsting, you think of being refreshed, your soul being refreshed, your soul being encouraged. 
your soul being given hope, courage, love, peace. Man. That's what Jesus is offering us. But this is bread and water for the soul. And it only works when it's Him. You see, the soul is never satisfied without Him. There is no cause you can immerse yourself in and have your soul satisfied. There are no beliefs you can practice that brings soul satisfaction. There is no faith community no level of fellowship that can do it. There are no relationships that can do it. There's no amount of money, fame, or position. There's no education, career, or trade. Jesus is the bread of life. It is a person. And when we have Jesus, and we hunger and thirst after Jesus will be filled. Will be filled. And the miracle of the manna will seem small compared to the miracle of the soul. I'd like you to look at John 6, 35. Please read this out loud with me off the screen. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I'm wondering if there's anyone here today that wants to come, who wants to believe, who wants to tell the Lord they believe He is the only answer to the needs of their soul. If you want to say that to God, I invite you to stand. Father in heaven, what can we say but thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior. We want Him, and we want the bread and the water that only He is. And we pray this in His name. Amen.